Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, as always, thank you to Miriam Friedman for organizing this uh, session and, and keeping me on task. Uh, an easier, uh, easier said than done. Um, I also specifically want to thank all the people who submitted questions. I think we've gotten uh, the uh, richest uh, collection of questions for a while in this series. So I, I, I guess, thank God, I guess we chose a good topic, but I certainly want to thank the, all the different people who sent in questions. I want to apologize ahead of time. Um, evidently, there were questions kind of sent in uh, in the 11th hour. I, I did not have a chance to, to look for those, and, and I apologize. My hope is that many of the questions that were submitted uh, recently uh, will be in similar to some of the questions that were submitted earlier. Um, of course, if if the question wasn't answered, people should please feel free to put it in the chat or uh, call it out at the end when we open it up to general uh, general questions. Um, I also want to go a little bit off topic, but I, it's relevant to Miriam, and I guess it's relevant to a, a number of people on the Zoom. Maybe we'll see the recording later. Uh, there was a technical difficulty with the Monday afternoon Jewish history class. It was my fault, and I, I apologize. Uh, I, I actually was using uh, the Zoom account that the class was on for a meeting with someone, and I, I did not realize the, the Zoom was going on, and somebody even texted me, and I was at a place that I didn't have cell phone reception. <laughs> so I got the text about about an hour after the class was supposed to be over. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. That's uh, apologize uh, for those not aware the class is, as was rescheduled for this Thursday. And uh, I will make a concerted effort to not be on this Zoom account uh, and block people out like I did last time. Okay, um, we're gonna get started. Um, I'll ask for people should feel free to submit questions in the chat as we go, but I'm really only gonna take, gonna address those questions once we've gotten through all the questions that have been um, submitted. Okay, I got a, a great, great list of questions. Let's just start. Question is, how is Maser calculated? When we are told 10%, what is removed from the base of that calculation? Um, there's no way I can appropriately answer this with all of the accompanying detail uh, in this venue. It's, it's, it's not gonna work, but I will try as best I can to give the general guidelines. And then of course, anyone who has uh, specific questions they would like to follow up on, are welcome to contact me out of the course of this, out of the context of this uh, group here. Um, because many specific questions are very specific to the people. Um, the basic concept of Masir is to give 10% of one's income, okay? Of uh, not 10% of the money that one has, 10% of one's income. So just to, just to kind of give some examples that for some people might be obvious, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. If a person will, will just do small numbers, just for the sake of the example, if a person, earns $100 in the year 2022 and sets aside mass here of $10 and they save 50 of the dollars that they earned. And then in the year 2023, they earn 100 more dollars in, in combination with the, uh, with the 50 that they saved, they now have $150 in the checking account. They only give $10 mass here the second year because they earned $100 the second year. The fact that they have $150 in the checking account is because they didn't spend all the money last year. You don't have to give Masir on a dollar more than once, but the but Masir is 10% of the money earned. Now, there are many, many nuances with calculations having to do with offsetting expenses. So just to sort of start simple and, and, and kind of maybe branch out, a little bit. Um, let's say a person just excuse me, I just have to stay focused. I'm sorry. No, okay. Let's say, let's say a person, um, let's say a person has a job and they're they're earning a hundred thousand dollars a year. See, look at inflation, we went from a hundred to a hundred thousand. Person has a job, they're earning a hundred thousand dollars a year, and um they realize. My gosh, I what I pay in transportation or parking exclusively to get back and forth to my job, not for other purposes, just to get back and forth to my job is, I don't know, you know, it's I'm 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 paying three hundred dollars a month, five hundred dollars a month for transportation and or parking, let's say. It would be absolutely reasonable to deduct that from one's income because that's an expense needed to get to one's 
income. Um, it would be appropriate to have that in mind from the outset. In other words, when one makes master designations, it, if a person, if a person earned, uh, you know, eight thousand dollars in a given month, and they set aside eight hundred dollars for mass air, then after they set aside eight hundred dollars for mass, they say, "Wait a second, but let me think about all my travel expenses." Um, it, it's it's a little bit too late in the game to do that because they sort of already designated money. Uh, towards charity. So the appropriate way to do it would be to think, okay, before I make my master designation, let me think about offsetting expenses. Let me talk about that um, for a moment, if I may. I'm about to break my normal rules. I just always have to say hello to Mrs. Bertha Spiro if I see her. Okay. Um, so just to, uh, just to uh, break, uh, just to talk about the numbers a little bit more for a moment. Person earns $8,000 in a given month, and they had $500 in travel or parking expenses. So that means they're walking away with $7,500. So then the mass there from the income of that month would be seven seven hundred and fifty dollars I hope that's making sense to people. Now, what's a, what's a much more classic, um, um, what's a much more classic experience uh, expense that has everything to do with income is taxes. So income tax. So I earn X amount of dollars and there's a certain percentage of that that I, I don't take home because the government says I need to share that with the government. So that is an expense of my income. That by definition is an expense with my income. So it's eminently reasonable uh, to not count income tax as, as part of the base from which one calculates mass here. Now, for most of us, in most situations, it's not so complicated. You just say, okay, let me take mass here on my take-home pay. You know, and then you might have other offsetting expenses that you can think about. But um, many of us, maybe we have, we're, we own private businesses. Uh, maybe we have parsonage-related tax matters. Um, Many of us pay taxes out of pocket. A significant amount of our taxes are paid out of pocket, pocket, estimated taxes, things of that sort. It's eminently reasonable to deduct estimated taxes or taxes at the end of the year, whatever it is, from the income that one earns before calculating mass here. Okay, I hope that, at least at a general scale, uh, answered that question. The next question is so important. I'm so glad someone raised it. <laughs> excuse me, for people who face a more severe reduction in income or increased expenses, master must be very difficult. How would you advise? Um, just to rephrase the question for a moment, let's say a person doesn't think they can afford master. What do you do? Is master an obligation? Is it not an obligation? So there's different opinions about master. There are opinions that say that master is an absolute obligation. There are opinions, Rabbi Einra Zahor of Racha, was very adamant about emphasizing this to people. There are opinions that Maser is an Eitzah Tova, a, a good advice, you know, words for the wise of how to share our wealth with others and is not an absolute obligation, okay? Which means that according to that opinion, if I can't afford to do Maser, I shouldn't do mass here. Or to say it differently, if my giving mass here will make me an appropriate recipient of someone else's mass here money, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? If I'm giving mass here and then I need stuck it to help me because I gave mass here, that seems to be something, there seems to be something missing in that. Um, so my personal advice to people if they can't afford to pay mass here, they shouldn't. Now, three comments about that. One is, especially because that's my personal advice, I would urge people, as Rabbi Einar Zichor Mavrocha did, that when people talk about their mass air calculations, they should do it blee netter. They should say when they have, uh, many of us have, uh, have like a little, uh, uh, record somewhere, you know, master funds or 
that a person should stipulate what I'm setting aside here is plea netter. I'm not obligating myself to this. This is, if I'm able to do it, this is what I hope to do. Um, that's, that's an appropriate conduct. Um, it's a follow-up point is, so a person can't afford to do maser. So then what? Then they just don't give anything? So broadly speaking, there's two approaches. One approach is they should give however much they can afford. Um, that's one approach. And then whatever they can't afford, they shouldn't give. There are other ways of calculating mass here based on one's financial abilities, not only based on one's income. It's a complicated discussion. Um, if anyone wants to find out more about that, uh, you feel free to contact me offline, okay? But that's, uh, so that's the second point and it's extremely important. Okay, the next question is somewhat connected to this, somewhat different. <clears throat> is there ever a case when someone gives too much charity? Well, if, if a person can't afford what they're giving, I personally would say, there are those who disagree to be candid with you, but if you're asking me, I personally would say if they can't afford it, um, then that means they're giving too much charity. That's one thing. Um, there is an idea in the Gemara that mass air, people are urged to give a tenth, excuse me, and people are told to not give more than a fifth. So there is an idea of not giving more than a fifth. Now, there's a lot of discussion about that in halacha. Does that say that one is prohibited of giving more than a fifth of one's income? Uh, is that to say it's advice? Is that to say maybe you're prohibited of giving more of a fifth of the income that you're actively using? Different opinions. But halavai, we should all have to grapple with that question. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the basic answer is a person's not supposed to give uh, more than a fifth of their income to charity. Okay. Um, next question. How does one prioritize who to give to? It's a really good question. Uh, I want to start with a website. Y-I-S-E dot org there's a donate button no that was just a joke um that was just a joke um but um i i'll just mention that uh when we started the idea of sponsoring drushas uh the first shabbos i was you know thank you whoever sponsored the Tresha. if i remember correctly i i mentioned that i know what you're all thinking how much does it take to pay me not to speak that that's a very high number that's a, okay um it's it's a very um it's a very real question how does one prioritize uh who to give to so let me speak broadly halakhically and then maybe i'll speak a little bit more practically um i i, I think it's fair to say there's two and a half variables okay uh one variable is level of need. It, it, theoretically speaking, heaven forbid a person comes, they don't have food to eat. They're going to starve. Right? So that is a higher priority of tzedakah than a person who's looking for help going to college. Just to give a theoretical example. Um, that's So one sort of column to be thinking about is level of need. Another, a, a person can't pay for medical treatment. It's a very high level priority. Um, another example, another category is where is the person, um, where is this need originating from? Is this need originating from my community or from another community? I have a greater responsibility to people in my community than to people in other communities. With one major exception was the community of Israel, of the land of Israel, the state of Israel. It could be Yerushalayim, different, different variations on that. But we, we're, we're taught that we need to see the needs in Israel as our own. Uh, so according to many, the needs in Israel are treated on the same tier as, um, as the needs of our own community. Now, what I mentioned when I spoke about a half 
is we have great responsibility towards our own family members. We have great responsibility towards our own relatives. Now, how does all of this come together? So I'm going to first speak theoretically, and then we'll kind of go from there. Theoretically speaking, there's a person, it has to be that I think it's a reputable individual. If I'm suspicious that they're not telling me the truth, it's a whole different story. But they have good source references, and, and the story makes sense, and I think they're doing everything they should be doing, etc. If there's a person, theoretically a Jew from Kansas, who's, who's heaven forbid about to die if you don't give him money, that's going to have higher priority than your next door neighbor who um, who's having difficulty paying for a simcha, even though the second example is your next door neighbor. Um, and that, candidly, is also going to have priority over your own family needs or needs of your own family. But if you have two people both with serious budgetary challenges of, sim of a similar nature, and one is from your community and one is from another community, then the one from your community has priority. And if the person is from another community, but it's a relative of yours, then that person has priority. So it's, it's a little confusing how the categories come together. And it's definitely reasonable to ask Shilas. Now, what we didn't speak about at all is communal infrastructure. In other words, everything we spoke about so far was personal needs. But there are yeshivas and shoals and mikvahs and chesed organizations and, you know, and all, and all kinds of needs. Um, so it would seem that theoretically speaking, one needs to do both. And I should also mention that there's a real concept in halacha of diversifying, you know, of giving different types. In other words, it shouldn't be that I figure out who's highest on my list of priorities and I give them all of my stock of money. It shouldn't be that way. We should spread it out. So you hear all of this and it's so confusing. So you have a sense of, of priority, but it's so hard to figure it all out. So, um, an example that I, uh, uh, a general piece of advice that I once heard, I think the star came Baltimore was very forceful, not forceful, but, but very much uh, promoted this, this advice a number of years ago. And I think it's good advice is that um, it makes sense to um, earmark a half of one's stuck of donations for local matters. Okay, and that that means that means in all in all seriousness, a person has their shul that they should be supporting. A person has, you know, yeshiva, mikvah, school, uh, bikur cholim, all these things that that are valuable to a person. Um, it it's appropriate to be giving charity funds to these organizations, and the scary thing, by the way is, and by the way, we have wonderful stuck organizations, you know, organizations like Yad Yehuda and Franco Foundation, that they're all about helping people in need. Most of the time, we don't know if the person sitting next to us in show needs money. Most of the time, we don't really know. But these organizations are very much plugged in. The problem is, if one gives charity based on the number of envelopes one receives, even if one gives small amounts for every envelope that one gets in the mail, you, you just wrote off all your tzedakah to very, very meaningful causes all over the world, literally. And if you can afford to help those people, that's great. But your own community, you have very little for at the end of the day. And the reality is that there's plenty of situations within our own community that are just as compelling, if not more so, than many of the very heart-rending letters that come in your mailbox. But the difference is, there's not a person sending the mail in your mailbox. So I, I personally, I'll, I'll also mention, um, uh, you know, when we when we talk about um, membership in organizations. Uh, whether it be a shul, a mikvah, um, what I tell people is what 
whatever is the financial benefit that they have from becoming members, they should deduct that from the amount they paid for membership. And then after that, they should, they can deduct all of their membership. They can treat all of their membership as it's stuck a donation. So let me, let me just give a theoretical example. Person is a person pays a thousand dollars membership to a show. Okay. The person, uh, because they're members of the show, they pay less for high holiday seats. Person benefits $50. They pay $50 less because they're members of the show. So I would say that they paid a thousand dollar membership to the show for the year. I would say that 950 of those dollars can come from earmarked stock of funds. I hope that I hope that's making sense to people. Um, again, this question also, we could have long private discussions about this. This is just general, sort of general guidance. I hope that was a little bit helpful. Okay. Um, is money you give your children to help support them considered stucca? That is a really, really important question. Um, what I would say for that is the first question is, is the, is the child's station in life one that most of us would say it's your responsibility to be supporting them? Let me, let me give you an example. 16-year-old child, your, your average American 16-year-old child lives at home and is supported by one or two parents. I mean, that's the average circumstance. So if a person were to sit there and say, my gosh, you know, my 16 year old doesn't earn any money, which means that every time that kid is eating me out of house and home, every time that kid opens the, the cabinet and noshes, why is it any worse than me writing a check to a hungry person? So I think intuitively we would say, ah, it's not, that's not stuck on, that's, that's raising a household. That's not, I, I think intuitively that's what, we, but that's what we would say. On the other hand, if a person, if a person has a child who's, who's out on their own, single, married, whatever it is, they're, they're, you know, they've been through school and they're, they've moved on and they're earning a living in life and, and, and they, can't, they can't make ends meet. And, uh, you know, if you don't write them a check, they don't have a way to uh, pay for the kids' tuition. They don't have a way to, to cover their health insurance, but whatever it is, I would say that absolutely counts as stucca. Absolutely. If it's the type of thing, I, I think the litmus test is it's the type of thing that someone were to come to you about someone who you didn't know. I would say, you know, there's such a need. There's this family, they can't cover their health insurance, their, their health insurance uh, premium for the month. I don't know about any of you. I would say, wow, that's stuck up. Huh? So the fact that it's your it's your relative doesn't make it less stuck. Huh? Actually, as we already discussed. The fact that it's your relative makes it an even higher priority, you know. Um, now, uh, now, uh, you know, if you if you want to get your grandchildren uh, the, the the next best uh, toy, because their parents can't afford to get the next best toy, and it's the, the the newest thing, and everybody has it, and you know, but your the parents can't afford it. I, I don't think that's stuck up. Huh? Just like, uh, you know, if someone came up to you, it's, you know, I'm raising money for the, for the newest iPhone for, for, for some kids. You'd say, what are you, crazy? I'm, I should give stuck up for that. So that, that's what I mean a little bit by the litmus test. Now, what I think is a tricky question that I think really has to be defined um, person by person is, you know, a child is in an advanced education program. You know, they're in uh, graduate school and the parent is helping them along. They're, uh, they're in uh, yeshiva for a year, whatever, you know, and, and, and you know, many, many years past, uh, you know, whatever the original expectations were and the parent is helping them along. Um, you know, and, it's, it's, and it, it is further along the, 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 the road then let's say the average community member is still being supported by their parents. Uh, intuitively, I think it, it probably does make sense to say that could be taken from stuck of funds. 
but I think it's hard to give a, a one size fits all rule for that. I think that's something that's to be thought about a little bit. I hope that answered the question. Um, okay. Um, I'm just gonna jump. I'm gonna, okay. You, you don't know what I'm skipping. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, but that'll make the next question all the more interesting, right? Um, what, what counts as part of my tithing when it comes to religious school slash university tuition? What about donating to a school fund that my children will benefit from? Um, so this is a really important question. The normal, there's a lot of discussion about this among postkim. Um, the normal advice I give to people uh, I mean, the, the the context where the question comes up all the time is um, is uh, uh, you know day school tuition. You know, can I and Hara, the day school tuition is uh, quite significant. Um, so I, I there is a lot of discussion about a lot of different opinions. I normally discourage people from taking day school tuition from master calculations, but I also emphasize to people that if they can't afford mass, they shouldn't give mass air. And then a lot of times I, I end up having a conversation with people about another way to uh, figure out mass air, not based on one's total income, but based on one's budgetary needs, which again, if people are curious, we can talk about it offline. Uh, but I, I really pursue it to the idea that we spoke about before, sort of in our community's expectations and norms, it seems to be expected uh, that people uh, cover the religious school needs of their children. Um, university tuition, my guess is it would fit in a similar category for that. I, again, it could be that people's specific dynamics are different. I, 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 again, I'm not saying this is one set rule. My guess is that most people in our community consider it their responsibility to pay for their children's undergraduate education. Maybe not. You know what I mean? If, if the dynamic is that in the home dynamic, the understanding is the child has to put money away and work, and that's how they'll pay for their for their undergrad education. Then it, it might make a lot more sense in that context for what the if the parent helps them out that that's called stuck. Maybe, but I think that would have to be decided on a case by case basis. Um, the person asked a really interesting follow up question: What about donating to a school fund that my children will benefit from? So. In theory, I think it's fine. So I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, one of my kids was involved in an extracurricular learning program and uh, from one of the schools. And uh, the Rebbe called me up and he said, you know, I'm raising money uh, to pay for the prizes for the kids. So I, I think it's a worthwhile thing to give money to uh, have incentives for kids to learn on their own time. I think that's something that we should be promoting as, 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 as a Orthodox community. I think that's appropriate. Um, it's not fair that it should be on the Rebbe's responsibility. So even if uh, one of my children gets one of those prizes, I, I'm not giving it as a, as a front to give my kid a prize. I'm, I'm supporting a program and my child happens to benefit the program. Now, mind you, if my kid doesn't end up getting a prize, I'm canceling the check. That was a joke. That was a joke. But um, but um, where I don't think it would work would be as follows. Uh, you know, I told you that I don't think uh, I, I, I don't think paying for day school tuition should be taken from mass. But that's my own approach. So you can imagine um, uh, a person. Um, you can imagine a, a, a person. Um, um, uh, day school tuition is $18,000. And this person is being charged $18,000. And thank God they can afford it. But they call up the school. They said, listen, I'll make you a deal. Charge me $15,000 and I'll give the last $3,000 as a donation to the school. And then it'll be for master money because it was a donation to the school. So that I think is just shtick. I don't, you know, I, I don't think that makes sense. Um, I want to just interrupt what we're talking about for a moment. I, I spoke about other communal institutions. I, I can't emphasize enough. I obviously have a bias, but it's a bias that many in our community share. Um, the financial burden 
on uh, the, the families raising children in our community to cover the expenses of our wonderful, wonderful community schools is tremendous. And the financial burden on the schools is tremendous. Um, I really think it's extremely appropriate that all community members should see it as part of their responsibility. Part of why our community is such a popular, wonderful place to live is we have great schools. I think it's really appropriate the same way that we see ourselves responsible to help support shuls and mikvahs and so on and so forth. I really think we should see it. It, it shouldn't only be if I send my kids to a school, I send them a check. It, it should be that we see it as, as, as part of the tremendous infrastructure of our community because they are. So sorry, that's just to uh, get off the soapbox for a moment. Okay, um, now I want to go back to my list here. It's a very interesting question. Hi, uh, let's say, heaven forbid, a person wants to give, uh, uh, there's an individual in need of tzedakah, and a person wants to help support them. Make the question a little more nuanced, it's actually a relative. And uh, unfortunately, the person who was supposed to be the recipient of the tzedakah, lo aleinu, but this is also a very real life question, uh, is struggling with addiction. And so you write them a check. And in your mind, this check is to help pay the rent or help pay for groceries. And uh, you have real suspicion that it's paying for drugs, lo aleinu, or paying for, for alcoholic beverages or unhealthy things and and then you're enabling what a terrible question i mean an important question so let's just speak about it conceptually it's obviously a great mitzvah to help a person who's uh, financially struggling it's a great great mitzvah to give a person money when it's not going to be put to good use is not um not correct not helping them and not a mitzvah uh, on the other hand, you don't know exactly what. And, um, practically speaking, a very common practice among many charity organizations and, and uh, rabbis, and et cetera, is um, in all kinds of cases, one, I, I, if, 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 if anyone ever gets this for me, it doesn't mean that it's because I suspect them. But in all kinds of cases, you write the check to the need. In other words, a uh, person, uh, person says, uh, you know, I, I, I need money to, I, I, I need money to help pay my rent. So if a person is concerned, they could say, no problem. I'm going to write the check directly to your landlord. Or I'm going to, you need money to help pay for insurance. I'm going to write the check directly to your insurance. Maybe it's embarrassing for you that I should write the check to your landlord. I'm sure you don't care if Blue Cross Blue Shield gets a check from me. So, so, so just re reassess the funds. You know, the money that you were going to write to Blue Cross Blue Shield, pay your rent with it, and I'll fill in the gap and write a separate check to Blue Cross Blue Shield. You need food? I'm going to go to Shalom's and I'm going to buy you Shalom's cards. So then... You know, again, like with so many things in life, a lot of it has to do with how you message when you're uh, doing it. Um, but uh, but in any event, to think about that, um, I, I think practically speaking, because the reality is even if they are, because they're grappling with an addiction, not because, but it could very well be they really do have real needs, just unfortunately they have temptations as well. So if you give them the money in a way that they can't use it for other things, you're really giving them staka and hopefully helping them navigate things appropriately down the road. Um, okay, great question. Is buying Purim or Rosh Hashanah cards from a religious organization a form of staka since I will use the cards to send to others? Um, let's... I want to bring out my point by contrasting it. Example number one, organization says $5 per Purim card. And if you give us $5, we'll give you one card. Uh, in lieu of Shalach Manos, a donation has been made in your honor. Ta -ta -ta -ta, and you can mail it to all of your, excuse me for one second, I'm sorry. And um, 
and you can mail it to all of your friends. Okay? Um, example number one. Example number two. Another organization says, you give us $25 and we'll give you a great Shalach Manis basket that you can give to your friends. So in one case, I'm paying $5 for a perm card. In one case, I'm paying $25 for a Shalach Manis basket. Those cases are worlds apart because the perm card is not really worth anything with no offense to all the wonderful artists who work on the perm cards. It's not really worth anything. It's a menschlich way of telling somebody I made a donation in their honor. That, that, that's what's going on, right? So this is, instead of my sending $5 to the organization, they write a letter to the person telling them I, I, I sent something in their honor. They give me a nice card that I can do so I don't feel empty-handed when, when I don't have shalach manas for them. So that's really $5 of the stucca. The $25 for the Shalach Manas basket example, there's nothing wrong with that. But the bottom line is, I'm getting something that's a $15 value and I'm paying $25 for, for it. Great. So what am I really doing? I'm making a $10 donation to the institution. So when I'm really getting something that's really usable, I should deduct its value from the amount. And that value should not be taken from Maser, but the additional amount should be taken from Maser. But if I'm not getting something of any value, or to say it differently, if I'm getting something that I couldn't care less about, right? They'll give me an autographed picture of all the graduating seniors. I'm sure those are wonderful kids, but I, 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 that doesn't mean anything to me, you know. So, so uh, even if even if theoretically the picture was worth four dollars, I don't have to deduct that from the amount that I'm giving to Maser because I'm not benefiting in any way from that. So, I, I hope I answered that question. Okay, great. Another great question. This is very much related. A person signs up for a lottery, it's stuck a it's stuck a raffle, it's stuck a you know and. They give uh, $25 for a ticket and the winner gets a free trip to Israel. Now, question, can they give $25, uh, can, you know, can, can the $25 be taken from stock of money? Question number one. Question number two, what if they would never in a million years donate $25 to this institution? And the only reason they're donating is they really want to get a free trip to Israel and they're hoping they win. Is that different? And question number three, if they do win, do any of the previous answers change? Okay, so the generally accepted approach in halacha is that if a person um, uh, submits, uh, you know, pays for it, stuck a raffle, the odds are you're not going to get what you're hoping for. So the normal understanding is you're making a donation, excuse me, and maybe you'll be fortunate. And maybe you'll win. So the, 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 standard, the standard approach is that you can take the money for the raffle, you could take that from stuck of funds. I think it's reasonable to do it even if you've never given to that institution ever in your life and you don't plan on it again unless they run the same raffle. Um, now, the interesting wrinkle of that is, let's say, you, um, let's say you win. So what happens now if you win? So... The standard approach is if you won, then one ticket's value should be pulled back out from my funds. In other words, if I, if I bought one $25 ticket and I won the trip to Israel, it was all right when I spent it that I took those $25 from my master fund, but then I should replenish the master fund with $25 if I win the tick, if I win the trip to Israel, because that was a great use of $25 that I benefit from in a very significant way. And if I bought three tickets, if I bought three tickets, each for $25, I don't have to replenish $75 worth. I only have to replenish $25 worth because... There was only one ticket that won. I didn't win with three tickets. I won with one ticket. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, another interesting question. 
one gives a donation to a political cause, such as APAC or something similar, is that valid in terms of staka? What if it had nothing to do with Israel? Um, I'm not sure everyone would agree with, with what I'm going to say. And people, of course, are welcome to discuss it with me in greater detail offline. Um, what I feel in general is if there's a concrete benefit to Jews, then it's reasonable to use master money for it. Um, by the way, I don't mean that in any way to attack non-Jews. It's just stuck of money is our opportunity to help our brothers and sisters. We have a greater responsibility to help our brothers and sisters than other people. So, you know, I I I think um, I think it's fair to say that a donation to APAC is helping Cloud Israel. I think it's fair to say that. Um, um, you know, you think of the military aid we receive many times through the, the efforts of APAC or, or similar organizations. Uh, you think of various other ways that Israel's well-being is enhanced through the efforts of APAC. I, I, I don't think it's such a stretch to say that a donation to APAC can be taken from mass money. I don't know if I'd give all of my mass money for that, but, you know, but I, was, I don't think that's such a stretch. Um, now, if a person if there's some political cause that a person believes firmly in, but it's not, it doesn't translate to a concrete benefit for cloud Israel, I think I'd be more wary of using massive money for that. Um, uh, on the other hand, if, if, uh, if a person felt that they were donating to a certain organization that they felt very strongly was gonna help Jews in Ukraine or the citizenry of Ukraine, Jews and non-Jews alike, I, I I think that's a reasonable thing to give master money to. So it's not an Israel versus non-Israel thing in my mind. It's a are Jews going to be significant recipients of of these efforts in one way or another? Um, a related question is giving to medical organizations, medical foundations, and I think it's very reasonable to to give donations to medical foundations for master. You know, if 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 they come up with a cure for cancer another cure for cancer, a better cure for cancer. <laughs> There's a lot of Jews that will benefit from that as well, of course. Okay, um, it's getting very late. Um, a person, I think these are all from one person, a person submitted beautiful questions. I'm just going to have to give one general answer to your questions, and I apologize for that. Um, the gist of the questions are, how do I calculate mass here? Let me break it down to two or three questions. If I get a discount in the store, do I have to take mass around the discount? I, you know, I, I want to buy a tie, and the tie is is thirty dollars, but it's 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 uh, ten dollars off. Do I consider the ten dollars income, and I now I have to give an additional dollar to Stucka? So I don't think so. I I, I don't think so. Um, an interesting question, if I earn rebates back from my credit card, do I have to give that to Staka? So I think, you know, I think if in your life it really monetizes in a way that you would spend that money. In other words, if it's like the kind of card that it's literally money back in your pocket, literally, I think you could make an argument that, that should have master taken. I think so. But you could also make the argument that it's it's sort of like a, a sale in another way. I could hear either argument for that. If it's not too troubling, it, it probably makes sense to, to, to calculate master off of that. But things like discounts or rewards on things that I might not have bought in the first place, I, I don't think you have to take master on that. Um, there's a big question. When do I calculate master? Do I calculate master when I take my money out of a fund? Do I calculate Maser every time I have a gain or loss in my investments? What do you do? It's a really, really good question. There's different approaches. One would be justified in taking Maser only when they actually pull money out. By the way, if they pull money out of a fund, the idea of taking Maser is taking Maser on the profits they have from that fund. In other words, theoretically, if they originally earned money, and they put a segment of it in an investment, so they already gave master on the principal. You, you know what I mean? In other words, the master would be on the profits they earned, the interest they've earned. Um, 
that that on the one hand is the cleanest way to do it. On the other hand, it could get very expensive because if a person pulls the money out 40 years down the road, you hope there's a lot of payoff in that account, in that fund, and then you're gonna get mass on all of that. That's uh that's pretty complicated. Um, so another way to do it would be to sort of set landmarks, like to say to yourself, every year, like once a year, I'm gonna look at the total up or down, or once a quarter, I'm gonna look at the total up or down, whatever the profit is, interest, revenue, I'll take mass around that. If, heaven forbid, not heaven forbid, but if hopefully not, there's a loss, then I'll deduct that loss from my master cheshbon from other things. Uh, again, I'm not doing justice to your very wonderful questions. I happen to discuss this offline. The last listed question, am I obligated to give money to any Jew who asks me for tzedakah? No, no. That's a very important question. There is an idea that on Purim, specifically, anybody who extends their answer, you're supposed to give them something. Doesn't mean you'd have to give them a lot, but specifically on Purim, if a Jew asks us for money, we're supposed to give them something. Um, but we do not have to give everybody. We do not have to trust them necessarily. They, in today's society, if they don't have reputable letters of recommendation or sort of certificates from reputable sources, there's, that's already two strikes against them. It is standard. I, I consider myself your shliach. When I give money, when you put money into Pushkat Shul, that's my discretionary fund. So when I write checks to the Mishulachim who come, it's, it's, it's from and whatever other you know, donations people make the discretionary fund. I consider myself your shliach, unless it's exceptional circumstances and there's other great ways for me to know the viability, reliability of the people. I do not give them from the Shul's discretionary fund unless they have a, a valid to da from, from the star K. It, and, and they know it. Believe me, they know it. If you see someone here collecting and they don't have, they don't have something from the Star K, it doesn't mean that they're liars. It doesn't mean that. But it's certainly a fair question. Why in the world didn't you go? I didn't know. You should have asked. What can I tell you? Now, you, if you want to decide for yourself to give them something, that's, of course, your prerogative. But you do not have to give everybody. And even if you trust them, we already spoke about there's so many causes pulling at us from so many sides in so many ways. We don't have to give everybody. We don't have to give everybody. Okay. Um, Minchas in 15 minutes. Anyone who has to go, uh, please do not be bashful to go. I actually already daven Minchas, so I'm not in such a rush. Um, but I apologize that it's so late already. Thank you for the wonderful questions. I'm going to first go through the chat questions. <laughs> okay, they're for cute jokes. You'll forgive me. I'm not going to take the jokes, but that doesn't mean they're not cute. Okay, Dr. Shine said, I feel like I've answered at least some of your questions through the presentation. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I can't speak to what Ariel submitted, but thank you, Ariel. Thank you for that. Um, the person who has submitted the question about the uh, family fund, such as Vanguard or Fidelity, um, I don't want to go into detail. I just don't want to take time going through the question for everybody. Um, basically, if that's your intention, as long as you're mindful of that in the good times and not as good times, that's okay, as long as you're consistent and you have a system. I will say there's an idea, though it's not an obligation, there is an idea, an encouraged idea of once a year trying to zero out your mass air calculations. Um, but the bottom line is, I could imagine... Uh, the complication of doing what you're doing, as long as you're consistent with how you do it, I would think that's okay. Hi. Hey. Someone submitted a question about giving on behalf of someone with dementia. A very real question, very reasonable question. Thank you for raising it. Um, on, on, on a basic level, 
I would say it's the person's money. Um, if their lifestyle was such that they were very diligent about giving X to charity every year, as long as they can afford it, I think you're, you're doing a nice thing by giving to charity, okay? If that was not their practice, or if that was their practice, uh, we all know that low elated people suffering from dementia, there are so many expenses to wrestle with. If they can't afford it, or if they can not afford it, but you don't know if they would want to do it, I don't think that's your responsibility. I don't think it's your responsibility. It's we can't, I'm not sure it's your right. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I'll tell you, Dr. Scheinson, I don't want to I, I don't want to share the details of what you put in because that's not for me to share, but but I feel like your example that you put in at 7.47 p.m., I feel like your example is one step further than the examples I was speaking about. You know what I mean? I mean, it's 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 an interesting thing, but it's an interesting thing to think about that, but that's just my gut. Okay, someone made a, a recommendation that it's a good plan to follow income tech rules in terms of deciding gains and losses. I hear that. I don't think that's a chiyof, but it might, it might be a good way to approach this. Okay, uh, at this point, to the best of my knowledge, I've addressed all the questions in the chat that I felt were appropriate for the context of this gathering. Um, anyone want to call out a question? Okay, um, if you still want to call out a question or, or chat something, if you have a little bit of time still, I just want to change the subject for a moment. Um, let's think about what what the next topic should be. And I want to thank all of you for, again, your questions are wonderful. Uh, and thank you for making it such a nice uh, opportunity, for, I think, for so many people. Now, last year we did one on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. My gut tells me that it's not terribly valuable to do another one, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, especially since I bet that that people could probably access the video somewhere. Um, and to be honest, we didn't have a plethora of questions on for that one, if I remember correctly. So unless there's some big push that we should do something for the, for the Yom Tovim, what might make sense, let me throw this out there for a second. What might make sense is to do something on a specific topic. Oh, thank you so much for putting that in, Menashe. I'll give you an example, and I'm curious if people put in a chat or let's say we did one on halachos of sukkah or halachos on lulav and esrog. Uh, these are things that I think people sometimes have questions about and maybe aren't so clear. Um, I think we once did halachos of cholamoy. I think so. I think so. Um, okay, so if I don't get a big response, I don't think we're going to plan to do it for the Yom Tovim. There is a question that has been put out. Um, maybe we could do a combo with kashering, by the way, about toveling vessels, immersing vessels in a mikvah. And maybe I'll suggest as a combo with that kashering vessels. Uh, are, do people find that interesting? Okay. Um, another possibility is... Uh, oh, <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> Menashe Katz just submitted Tovaling. That's a slam dunk. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, we're getting some positive feedback for, for Tefillah. Uh, maybe we'll do Tefillah and Kashri. I see someone else put it for Kashri. Uh, maybe we'll think about it. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's that much to talk about. There's some to talk about. We did a Shemitah class. Um, did a Shemitah class. I'm not so excited about doing Shemitah for the eighth year. And I hear you. I don't think it's a crazy idea, but yeah. I'm not so excited about that. Um, yeah, somebody put in cash for, for, for Pesach. The problem is that when it's before Pesach, we we there's so many other things going on. It's hard to, you know, kind of. Okay, so I think tefillah and kashering is a winner. Miriam, did you want to say something? Is uh, yeah, I I the tefillah tefillah kalim is good, and I'm is there's nothing um 
I guess it's not really related like with the Shekhyanu because when you get new certain new things, but I guess it, it's not really so relevant if you wanted to add to the topic, so it would be longer. But I guess it's not it's not relevant. Let's enough. think about that. Maybe, maybe let's you and I think about reflect on that. That could be like separate, but the tefillah, tefillah Kalim and right. koshering stuff would be good, and then Chachianos could be another. Maybe topic. yeah 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 yeah. Um, I don't know. Is... No no no. Thank you for that. So I think if that's the case, I think maybe it makes sense to not schedule the next one for September. September, you know, people are. It's only a few weeks to Yom Tiv. And uh, I don't know, I think people have minds on all kinds of other stuff. And I don't think this is uniquely oriented to Yantiv. What do people think? Do people think we should schedule for the first week of September? Or do people think we should wait until after the Yom Tovim? Any quick thoughts one way or the other? Okay. Okay. I say, wait, you've got enough on your plate with the young. Well, don't worry about me. Don't worry <laughs> about me. And the plate, I'll tovel it. Thank you. That was too easy. Thank you, Janet. Um, um, okay. You know, um, yeah. Yeah. Why don't we do it? Let's do it. Yumtiv is late this year. Yumtiv is, is, is the end of, uh, so uh, God willing, we'll, we'll, you know, stay tuned. But uh, so God willing, the next will be Tefillah and Kashering. And hopefully we'll do it at the beginning of September. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Take care. You too. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. <clears throat>